I'm Letitia Kenimer, and I'm the Fine Arts Coordinator at the Memorial Union. Um, in fall of 2010, I got a postcard from Grandview College, and it was um, highlighting the Silent Mo No More exhibit. And I get things like that all the time, and I stuck it in a like idea folder for later. And this summer, when I was setting up exhibits, um, I emailed uh, Mary Chind, and um, we emailed back and forth. And usually, it's a year or two wait to get into exhibit here. But um, I happen to have an opening at the end of this year because of some scheduling conflicts, so she accepted, and here we are today. Um, I'm really pleased to have um, this exhibit because it's got both the photography artistic element and also um, a lot of social issues and um, world issues that go along with it. Um, we are very pleased to have uh, both Pulitzer Prize winning photographer Mary Chind and Dr. Neil Monsager here to talk about their visit to Uganda, um, documenting the trip through photography and Child Voice International. Uh, the sponsors of the exhibit and the gallery talk are Student Activity Center, the Student Union Board, and um, Committee on Lectures. Uh, Neil's going to talk first, and then Mary, and then we will have time for a Q&A, so if you have questions, um, we are uh, recording this for a podcast, so we'll ask that you go up to the mic over there uh, during the question time. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil Monsager. Can you hear me? Thank you, Latricia. I really appreciate this opportunity to, um, to speak to you. I thank all of you for coming out. Uh, um, thank Mary for um, tagging along a few years ago and uh, bringing the voice of these children to life. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a physician in uh, Des Moines, Iowa at Mercy Hospital. I'm a high-risk uh, obstetrician, so if any of you have had friends or family come down to Des Moines with a high-risk pregnancy, you may have run across me. I've been there about 18 years now. It was the spring of 2006 as I was sitting at my desk at work and I got this call from my older brother, Conrad. I hear from him periodically, you know, but certainly not on any regular basis at that time. So it was kind of a, a, a shock just to get his call and then to hear what he had to say was even more of a shock. Unbeknownst to me, he had just come back from a trip to northern Uganda with his oldest son. And uh, after seeing what he saw, he was felt called to form this organization, new organization called Child Voice International, with a vision to restore the voices of children silenced by war. And when I heard this, I was embarrassed, number one, and in awe, number two. Embarrassed because I was totally unaware of the havoc uh, that the Lord's Resistance Army had created and caused in this part of the world over the previous 20 years. And in awe that to think that, you know, that he and I together with uh, people that we could bring along with us could actually bring something like this to life. But now five years later, I'm proud to say that, that we have brought it to life. And these pictures that you'll see here tonight are um, symbolic and actually represent what we have going uh, in northern Uganda. So what I was unaware of was that Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army had uh, begun this rebel war back in 1987 with the intent of overthrowing the government and, uh, take, and, uh, and taking over. And at that point in time, it really wasn't unrealistic to think that that might actually happen because all the previous presidents had come to power as a result of, uh, of a rebellion, an armed rebellion. Um, right now, we kind of think, you know, it's pretty ridiculous to think that that could actually happen. But at that point in time, it really wasn't. Um, unfortunately for northern Uganda, um, he was unable to, to maintain the... Uh, the, uh, the attraction to his organization that he needed to, to keep his, his, uh, his war going. And so he began to resort to abducting children to fill his army. And so he would um, attack these villages in northern Uganda and, uh, and abduct children and force them to become soldiers and the girls to become sex slaves and carriers and whatever else they needed the girls to do. 
When my brother went in 2006, um, he saw the devastation that this war had brought to this part of the world. And as I said, he felt called to do something about it. I agreed to travel with him that summer with a small team to, to see whether his vision for Child Voice was, was on target. And I was able to see um, what, uh, what he saw. I was actually born uh, in Cameroon, Africa um, to uh, uh, missionaries. And this was my first trip back in 50, in 50 years to Africa. And uh, it, was, it, was for, it, was, it was quite a moment for me. Um, one of the things that sticks with, stick, stuck with me at the time was in rural Africa, 50 years later, not much had changed. There was still extreme poverty. Uh, Health care was um, scattered at best. Um, people were dying from basic diseases that you and I fortunately don't have to worry about. Um, and people were still living very simply off the grid in, uh, in traditional mud huts. But what we also saw in northern Uganda was the result of this rebel war where um, basic infrastructure had been devastated. The, war, the roads were bad. Um, the routine retail that exists in, in that part of the world was non-existent. Uh, Health care was uh, unavailable in many parts of that area. Um, and the people were definitely suffering. Many of them were living in IDP camps, internal displacement camps, which the government had created to try to protect them from the, uh, from the rebels. Um, so they had been brought off their land, forced into these very compact, small villages uh, without access to land to grow food. So much of the food was being brought in by relief organizations. And as I said, stayed in one of these, uh, um, by one of these pictures, more people were dying in these camps from disease and malnutrition than from the bullets of the war. So that's what we found in 2006. Um, we also discovered at that time that children were still walking uh, every night. They would, the children that lived out in the rural parts of northern Uganda would walk um, kilometers, miles, uh, spend the night in a safe haven in, the, in town uh, like Gulu, uh, oftentimes in churches, sleeping on the floor, cramped together, and the next morning they'd get up and walk back home or, or to school if they were lucky. And we, were, we saw that. Fortunately, uh, that is no longer happening. Um, but it was quite, uh, quite an image to, uh, to see at that time. Uh, we also encountered these women who had been abducted from their homes, forced to become sex slaves, and uh, live in the bush for several years, miss out on the, uh, the important years of their primary education. And oftentimes when they were able to get back, either by escaping or by being rescued by the army, they often had a child or two with them, children of the rebels called devil's children by their family. And they were rejected. So they were trying to survive on the edges of society in whatever ways they could, um, just to try to build some kind of future for themselves and, and their children. But by themselves, we saw this wasn't going to happen. There, were, there just aren't the resources there that we have here. There was no adult education. Once they have a child as a, as a young girl like that, they're not going back to school. They're not going to learn a trade. They're not going to be able to sustained for themselves. So Child Voice was, came to be as a way of trying to provide that infrastructure to allow these kids to recover and rehabilitate themselves and get themselves back on their feet. And that's what we've done. We uh, stepped into a, uh, an abandoned school in a small community north of Gulu um, and re refurbished it. And uh, uh, we now, over the last, uh, since 2007, we brought in about 100 girls, 30 at a time. Each of them spend uh, about 18 months with us. Um, during that time, they receive counseling. Many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, as you can imagine, as you hear their stories. Um, they, um, we provide them catch-up education, such that uh, by the time they leave, we hope they can at least do some basic math and uh, some basic reading and writing in their native language. And then we provide them job skill training so that when they leave, they'll have a job um, uh, that they can, a business that they can open, a small business they can open and provide for themselves and their kids. And that's what's happened, uh, with exception of maybe one student who went on and had a couple more kids after she left our program. All of them are actively engaged uh, in a business 
and are providing now for themselves and their family. But beyond that, they, they, you, you have to experience what they look like when they come in. Uh, they're distraught, they're depressed. Uh, many of them have to talk about committing suicide if they had not been able to come to Child Voice. Um, and when they leave, they have this, this hope again that, uh, uh, that's really been a thrill to see. Um, we have dreams for um, expansion. Um, there's still many of these kids out there. Uh, we actually had a girl uh, come in from the bush just last spring. Um, so they're still out. The kids are still out. They're still coming in, not as fast as they, not in the large numbers that they used to. But I asked one of our staff, uh, thinking that at some point in time, Child Voice really won't have a purpose in northern Uganda. And so I kind of talked to him about, well, when will that be? How long do we need to be here? And he said, yes, the guns are silent now, but the need is still great. So we feel like we still have a purpose in northern Uganda for a number of years, but we want to expand. And uh, I want to just spend the last few minutes here and then turn it over to Mary, talk to you a little bit about an exciting thing that uh, some of the Iowa State students from years past have done for us. We, uh, we approached, uh, um, shortly after we organized, we approached uh, some architects that we knew in Des Moines at RDG Planning and Design and asked them to, to design a community for us that we could build out on some land that we were looking at. And um, one of those architects, Kevin Nordmeyer, uh, was also a professor at Iowa State. And uh, one spring, uh, he assigned his fifth-year design students to design a master plan for the community that, we were, that would work for us. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, the land deal that we thought we had fell through. And we've been struggling to, to get a land deal, but we finally got one last, uh, last August, a long-term lease on 70 acres of land right up the road and across from where we're currently at. So we went back to them just recently and asked them to kind of retool that design. And that's what you see up here. We're hoping in the next month or so, if we can get the funding, we'll begin building that out um, and move our program across the road to a permanent uh, facility. These actually are two of the models that have survived my garage over the last few years. Uh, the one on the right is a chapel, um, and the, this is a cutout of the school building that's been designed for us. So I want to thank all of you for coming. I uh, hope you have time to, to, to look at these, at these pictures. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mary now, and she can tell you her story, and then we'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you. a little tall. <laughs> well, uh, as a news photographer, I've always been content to stay close to home and cover local news um, centered around my local community. I consider myself a bit of a nester. With that said, the news assignments that I've taken me the farthest away from the nest have proved to have given me the, some of the most memorable moments of my life. This photo exhibit would not be possible, and it would not be here if it weren't for my friend and colleague, Tony Lays. In an editor, editor's office back in 2005, Tony pitched an idea for a story about Medicine for Molly, an organization founded by a Des Moines doctor who was helping people in Western Mali. I was assigned to accompany him on that trip, and the result was a beautiful 10-page special section which um, I was able to help design. This was probably the most beautiful photo display I've ever had in my career, and the, the project was just a wonderful experience. Part of the reason for that is that four years later, um, we were able to use those beautiful news clips to apply for a mini fellowship with another idea of Tony's to cover Child Voice International and tell the story about these women uh, needing rehabilitation in, in Uganda. As a team, Tony and I were awarded a $7,000 mini fellowship through the Kaiser Foundation. It was just enough to cover a shot or two and our plane tickets. The fellowships are awarded to journalists to cover global health issues. By sheer coincidence, at the same time we received our fellowship, um, the register was ready to run 
two other stories about Africa within months of each other. Uh, as a result, our project was the last of the three to be published. We traveled to Uganda with Neil and his group in November 2009, and our story held until February of 2010. We did not receive the same amount of newsprint, but on the other hand, we did have the internet going well, and I was able to publish five videos, which told much more than the pictures could, and I was also able to publish uh, about 200 images in various photo galleries on our website. Uh, this was a, when I went to Mali, we didn't have as much. I may have had a few photo galleries, but the big difference was the video, and I think um, just having some of the moments and actually hearing the voices and being able to take those home to people in Iowa was a real advantage of the time. After the story ran, Neil and I began discussing ways that our pictures could be used to help child voice in the future. By August 2010, the Silent No More exhibit was on display at Grandview University. To my surprise, this show has spent more time on display at various locations than I had ever anticipated. It has been the first exhibit I have ever had, but I'm sure it will not be my last. I owe a big thanks to Neil for all of his assistance getting these prints made and for offering his encouragement. I'd like to just share a few impressions about the trip, and I'm sure, hoping that you guys will ask me more specific questions. Uh, some of the, the trip itself, I would say, was just one of the most challenging and both rewarding trips I've had in both mental, mentally and both physically. Uh, some of the challenges included working in a foreign country, something I don't do very often, with different social customs, wearing different types of clothing, um, going in unusual living conditions, and having language barriers. It was also, I knew it would be difficult to portray through photographs what had happened to these women who are now at the stage of being rehabilitated and, and assisted. The girls we met showed us nothing but love and admiration for our interest in their stories. So it was really hard for me to fathom what had happened in their terrible pasts. We did, not, um, we did not question the girls about their time in the bush directly during the war because it could disrupt their healing process. Through the center's counselor, Winnie, we were able to learn some details about the life of one of the girls who was there named Carolyn, who had a very horrible history yet still showed signs of strength and leadership among the other girls at Child Voice. I admired her in many ways. One night near the end of the trip, I showed her pictures of my world using my computer. I could only wonder what she was thinking as she saw various, various, all these various things that are not part of her country. Um, I hope our brief exchange gave her some small amount of motivation and wonder. The most rewarding photo for me of this whole exhibit may seem very mundane to others. It shows Carolyn putting her arm around a friend, Rima. This small gesture of friendship is a strong signal of the healing that is taking place at Child Voice. And that is the ultimate goal at the Lacomai Center. So that's pretty much all I have um, on paper, but why don't you come up, Neil, and we'd like to entertain any questions you guys have for us. question? <laughs> I'll just add to that uh, story about Carolyn. Um, That's the picture right over there. It's kind of behind the board right now. <laughs> just to kind of give you a brief idea of what uh, these lives were like for these girls. Um, Carolyn um, had maybe the misfortune at the time anyway of being a fairly athletic girl and uh, quite strong. And um, the commander um, that captured her saw this quite quickly. And he told her fairly soon after capturing her that he was, she was going to become a killer. And indeed she did. She tells the story of the most graphic uh, episode was um, they had captured a, a bunch of villagers. 
uh, and quickly realized they couldn't handle moving quickly with all of them in tow. So one morning they lined these 40 some people up on the road with their hands tied behind their back, had them kneel down in the road, and Carolyn and one other girl were instructed to go down the line and kill all of them by beating them. That's just one example, and you wonder how these girls come out of that uh, healed and healthy. Um, it's part of the reason why the, mis the vision of trial voice is one of intense therapy. We don't think these kids can recover by coming into a community program one hour a week. Um, we firmly believe that it requires an intense residential program that we offer uh, where they can learn how to live with each other, learn how to trust each other, and become uh, human beings like you and I again. Carolyn, um, on the one hand, um, was a killer, but and, and, uh, she also demonstrated compassion in that uh, she encountered a, uh, a friend of hers dead on the battlefield one day, strapped to this girl's back was her little baby. The baby was alive. Carolyn took this child as her own and uh, adopted her later on and has continued to raise her as her own. Um, in addition to the other, another child that she had born in the bush. She's now an itinerant preacher in northern Uganda. Uh, she carries a cell phone, and she, when people need somebody to pray for them or provide some pastoral counseling, she goes out and answers their call. So again, she's one of our success stories. So again, we'll open it up for for questions, but I just want to kind of add added to Mary's comments about Carolyn. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering um, how how young are these kids when they're put into um, action? In yeah, um, they can be abducted as early as eight, nine years of age. Um, the time in the bush is variable. Some of them uh, are lucky enough to only be out there um, six or eight months, but many of them are out there for years. Um, there's a picture of Rose on one of these pictures over here. Uh, she was actually in captivity for 17 years. She was actually a wife of Joseph Coney. Uh, we have another woman who's actually now working at our facility after going through our program, uh, who also was a wife of Joseph Coney and lived with him for 14 years. Um, they both have children of, of, of Coney's. There's many children of Joseph Coney out in northern Uganda right now. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just wondering some of like the examples of like the, the ther kind of therapy you give them or like the way you structure the, like, their lives so it, it kind of helps them rehabilitate. We are a Christian organization. Um, and uh, it... Uh, while we're not trying to convert these kids necessarily, um, we do provide them with the spiritual counseling in addition to um, um, psychological counseling, individual counseling as well as group therapy. Winnie, our counselor, um, um, I think uh, finds a lot of benefit from the group counseling where the girls uh, begin to interact with each other. Uh, one of the biggest problems in northern Uganda, even as we deal with the local community and the local leaders, is one of trust. Uh, there's been a lot of distrust built up and uh, not knowing who to trust because, these, again, these rebels came out of uh, their, own, uh, their own villages. So, um, so there's, that's, that's a big hurdle to overcome, and I, I, I agree with Mary when she talks about um, the importance and what that picture represents where... The one girl has her arm wrapped around the other. She's obviously um, trusts that girl and is a, and sees her as a friend. You said you had uh, many people that were success stories and had built businesses and had moved on. How many of them do you find coming back and are involved in the program? Or do many of them stick around, or do they do they kind of uh, separate themselves and move forward? The majority of them go back into their own villages and, and set up uh, businesses. Um, we have uh, hired several of these girls to, to work for us. Um, as I said, uh, one of them, um, uh, she's now our matron. Uh, another one works in the office. Uh, another one is a cook uh, for our staff, as a staff person. So uh, some of them do stay on, um, 
but, uh, but the majority of them are going back to their villages. And it's one of the challenges that we put forward to the design students was uh, knowing that these girls are going to go back to um, uh, rural Africa. We didn't want to, div we didn't want to build a, a, um, a community that was so westernized that they would have difficulty going back to, to living what they're, what they're used to. So on the one hand, we wanted to you know, improve sanitation, improve water quality, et cetera. But um, as you'll see in the design, um, we're utilizing the traditional mud huts in our residential um, buildings, and uh, um, we're, we're trying not to um, move too far away from what they're used to. Um, I was just wondering how long the girls actually like, stay in, during like, in the program, like if they, if there's like, a certain amount of time, or if they have to accomplish certain things before they are like released to go out and to. Yeah, there is there is some uh, uh, evaluation process that goes on. Uh, right now, uh, we 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 think that 18 months is a it works out for for most of the girls, and that's what they've spent with us. But we're we're as we um, do more evaluation of our program. Again, we've only had it in place for three years. It's a unique program. It's not one you're going to really see duplicated elsewhere, in, in, at least not in post-conflict zones. Um, so we're continually in the process of evaluating that, and it may change. We've talked about maybe some of these girls, you know, after 12 months can go into a halfway house, uh, so to speak, and not necessarily have to be uh, in our program but uh, on a daily basis. But right now they're spending 18 months with us. I'm uh, curious about the children that were born of these ladies that had been taken away. How are those children doing and how old are they now? Uh, that's a good question. Um, one of the reasons that we decided to, since our capacity was very limited as we started, uh, we decided we couldn't uh, go out and help everybody. So we saw these women as kind of the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, number one. And we also saw them with these children knowing that if if they weren't able to get back on their feet, not only were their lives going to be at peril, but so were the lives of their children. So we're really looking at a two-generation effect. Um, so that's, again, one of the reasons why we uh, made the uh, uh, intentional uh, decision to start our program with, with these girls. Um, these kids are, again, some of them were born in the bush. The ones that are bo were born in the bush are now more in the, in the age of uh, four, six, seven years old. Um, but other, they have other children that uh, were born after they came back. Uh, many of them were a uh, result of rape. Um, and others were, some of these women, the only way they could put food uh, at the, on the table, a uh, uh, roof over their heads, was to become the third or fourth wife of, uh, of somebody. And they would have a child as a result of that, uh, that marriage. So uh, there are a variety of uh, stories about where these children came from. but. The majority of them that we have in our program are in the toddler reign age, and then we have a few that are, are older and um, going to school. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, how many photos do you think you took? And then how did you decide what you were going to um, use in the exhibit? Well, um, I'm pretty sure I had at least 2,000. I know I told you when I was there. I don't remember off the top of my head. Probably around 2,300 pictures, I would guess. And that's why it was great I was able to use 200 on the internet <laughs> because it is hard to narrow them down. And there are so many good moments that I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, but for the purposes of telling a story, you really do have to weed out anything that's redundant. Um, so I may have had, you know, 12 different photos that all showed the same thing. I would have to sit down and decide which one of those did the most effectively. Or if there was just a, a real moment that was captured, then that, you know, would rise to the top. So it was a process of weeding through for the newspaper. And then when it came time for the exhibit, I had different criteria, I would say, um, I didn't have to exactly tell the story as the reporter did. I could, you know, pick out my own moments. And so I think I did go with a lot of just really good moments and try to still get a good variety of the experience. Other questions? Before we go, I'd like to um, throw a couple things out. I see a lot of students here, and I read the uh, article in the... Uh, 
uh, Iowa State Daily yesterday, and I know there's a, a number of organizations here on campus that are um, doing very good things, uh, um, not, not just in Uganda, but in Africa and elsewhere around the world. And I really want to encourage you guys to continue that. That's awesome at your age to be doing that kind of thing. Um, we, um, we have multiple needs, um, and we'd love to engage with you guys if you're interested. Uh, we have intern pro internship programs that uh, we offer to students uh, to go out there for a month, two months, three months, uh, whatever the program um, turns out to be. Um, be prepared. You're going to live uh, pretty rustically, uh, if that's a term. Um, uh, we're off the grid, so minimal electricity at best. Um, drop pit latrines, cold uh, showers, um, living in mud huts. Uh, our, our visitors live in uh, hammocks, uh, suspended hammocks in these huts uh, with mosquito netting over them. So it's, uh, you're deaf, the advantage is you're living right there with the girls and you're, you're living their lives and uh, it's, it's been a great experience for students. Um, so that's one thing and you can get this information on our website, uh, childvoiceintl.org. Um, the other thing is, uh, uh, you can see some of the images here in this book I have up here. Uh, we are one of, we've, we've always had a goal as, a, as an organization to become as sustainable as possible. And so we, um, we have a farm, so we have ag projects uh, ongoing. So if anyone has an interest in, in uh, it's Iowa State after all, right? Um, there's those opportunities. Um, but we also uh, uh, have uh, started a bead project. And uh, the girls in our center are not making these beads. We actually hire an additional 40 women in the area that come in now and make uh, beads out of paper by hand. Um, and then um, uh, create uh, beautiful pieces of jewelry out of them. Uh, you, again, you can find uh, examples and actually buy some of these products on, on the website. But if there's, um, and again, it's, it's in a, the, the project usually attracts women. Um, if there are any women here that were interested in, uh, um, you know, creating a, a, a way of uh, distributing these necklaces on campus uh, with sororities or however, again, that's uh, something we'd love to get going up here at Iowa State. We've got that going at uh, some other colleges around the area. So anyway, I just kind of wanted to close with that. Um, and uh, um, Mary and I will hang around for a little bit um, if anybody wants to be more comfortable asking us questions in person. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Can I ask you to work? He's at now. Can I ask you to work? He's at now. Can I ask you to work? He's at now.